Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our esteemed speaker for this morning, Dr. Mike, Micah Van Gerwen. Dr. Van Gerwen is currently the Director of Research and Assistant Professor with, within the Department of Otolaryngology and Head and, Neck, uh, Head and Neck Surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. Dr. Van Gerwen is also Scientific Director of the Program of Personalized Management of Thyroid, Can Thyroid Disease and member of the Institute of Translational Epidemiology and Transdisciplinary Center on Early Environmental Exposures. Her primary focus is leading thyroid research program, which aims to improve care and outcomes of thyroid cancer patients by combining basic clinical and epidemiological research. This program specifically concentrates on identifying environmental exposures that contribute to thyroid cancer risk. Dr. Van Gerwen has a wealth of knowledge and experience and her contributions to the fields of endocrinology are invaluable. We're excited to have her and, and hear her insights on this important topic. But before we begin, we encourage, we do encourage all the audience to send in their questions through the Q&A &Q &A function. And we'll try to get to as much of them as we can by the end of the hour. So without any further ado, Dr. Van Gerwen, the mic is all yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this nice introduction. And thank you for having the opportunity to present on our work on thyroid cancer and environmental exposures. I'm really happy to. So this lecture follows my recent publication, which is entitled, It May Not All Be Overdiagnosis, The Potential Role of Environmental Exposures in Thyroid Cancer Incidence Increase. So following the introduction of uh, Dr. Gonzalez, um, I'm an assistant professor and director of research in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. I have no financial conflict of interest to this slide. So as you are all well aware, we have seen a worldwide increase in thyroid cancer incidence rates over the past decades. This is not only seen in the US, it's been seen in, um, in a diverse range of countries as shown in this recent publication of 2021. You can also see that in certain countries, we can see a sort of stabilizing factor a stabilization in this trend, and this may be caused by multiple, uh, a variety of factors. The implementation of more conservative diagnostic guidelines, uh, which is probably also related to the fact of the raising, rising awareness of the risks of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and the downstaging of, of cancers. If we focus on the thyroid cancer incidence in the US. We uh, have this recent publication of 2019 where you can see again this stabilizing trend of thyroid cancer incidence in the US starting in around um, 90, 2009. So up till then we see a, a annual percent change of 6.6% and then it sort of stabilizes. However, when we when, when the investigators stratify the tumors by tumor size, having a mark off and, and cut off at, at one centimeter, you can see that the sub-centimeter tumors have, um, have this stabilizing trend, while the, the, the tumors that are more than one centimeter are still uh, continuing to rise at a significant annual percent change of 2%. Another interesting fact is shown in this publication on pediatric thyroid cancer, where they can see a rapid increase of pediatric thyroid cancer starting in around 2006. So up to then it goes up a little, but in 2006 you see a really sharp increase at a 9.6% rate. So the question is whether this is due to a more aggressive workup of thyroid nodules in the pediatric population or whether there is a true increase of pediatric thyroid cancer. So these are all um, signs and, 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 and um, publications that led to where I am in, and, and the, the, the work that I'm doing today. So the question came up whether these, these increasing trends are due to overdiagnosis, or are there potentially other contributing factors in play? 
So this this audience is well aware of the of the overdiagnosis of the of the definition of overdiagnosis overdiagnosis, which is the detection of disease that is not destined to lead to any clinical symptoms or affect survival. And the well-known example of overdiagnosis was seen in South Korea after the implementation of the National Screening Program in 1999. So what they saw after the implementation of this program following this graph is that there was a, an exponential increase of thyroid cancer incidence. Um, and it was mainly caused by, by papillary thyroid cancer. While the mortality rates remained low and stable, as you can see here at the bottom of the graph, so there was a really a, a sharp increase of just detecting um, detecting tumors. And they were saying, well, this is because we implemented the screening program. Although the screening program did not um, consist of had a thyroid cancer screening implemented in it, it was offered at a um, an easy access add-on to add to the, the other screenings that were, were offered. There are, however, some signs in the literature that there may also be other factors in play besides the, the increased detection of low-risk small disease. If we look at this study in, published in JAMA in 2017, we can see that if we focus on papillary thyroid cancer, that this, 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 in, this trends of, of this incidence in papillary thyroid cancer increase across the board, not only in the localized and regional stages, but also in the distant stages. So if you, if we think that it's all due to overdiagnosis because we're screening, then we would think that we would find more localized and um, um, less advanced cancers. And that over time as well, the mortality rates would go down because we would find them in an earlier stage. And this is not what this, this publication found. They found that even the distant papillary thyroid cancers, um, the incidence of those still increased over time, as well did mortality for all stages, as you can see on the graph on the right here following. Um, so it's not only the distant ones, the regional and localized mortalities also increased over time. So this cannot completely be explained by just having people screen more often, finding more frequently low-stage smaller cancers. And another important thing to, to notice is the thyroid cancer in children and adolescents. So I already mentioned that there is an increasing trend in finding more um, pediatric thyroid cancers. But we can see that in, in this population, which is not necessarily screened, uh, frequently, especially the adolescents, they hardly see a doctor. They they uh, are probably the part of the population that goes to the, to the doctor least. We can still see an increase in thyroid cancer rates over time uh, for both uh, the the smaller as the uh, larger tumor sizes, as well as the uh, localized and regional and advanced stages. So we thought there might be something else in play as well besides. This, this, um, this screening component, this overdiagnosis component. So there are a couple of known modifiable risk factors for thyroid cancer and obesity is, is one. So obesity is associated with a 1.3 fold increase of papillary thyroid cancer. And this recent study by, uh, published by Kitihara in 2020 showed that obesity and overweight accounts for about 14% of the annual percent change in papillary thyroid cancer incidence rates, as you can see on the first graph here. If we then focus on the larger tumor sizes on the right, so the size is more than, um, tumors more, measuring more than four centimeters, you can see that this goes up even all the way to um, about 58%. So showing that overweight obesity is potentially partly also associated with this increasing trend of thyroid cancer. Another well-known risk factor, as you all are all well aware, is ionizing radiation, which was first described by Duffy and Fitzgerald in 1950. They published a case series of pediatric thyroid cancers um, and found that about 32% of these 28 
um, pediatric and adolescent patients had received low voltage, voltage X-ray treatment for enlarged thymus in, when they were between four and 18 months old. So that was an, 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 an important um, awareness that, that a large part of this, this population has been, had been receiving um, radiation treatment. So, uh, and then and the next one is, uh, there are um, a lot of studies following the Chernobyl disaster of 1986, uh, where a lot of radiation, uh, the population around Chernobyl was exposed to a large um, cloud of radiation, which went all the way up into Europe. And what they, say, what they found was, uh, besides a lot of thyroid cancer, uh, we found, they found um, these, these Specific mutation signatures in these radiation-induced uh, PTCs include a double a DNA, a DNA double strand breaks. Uh, in this uh, publication published uh, last year, two years ago, and what they also described is that with the increasing radiation dose, this there was a strongly associ strong association with an increased likelihood of fusion. So the higher the dose of, of radiation, the more risk they, patients have to have um, 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 fusions underlaying their, their thyroid cancer. And another important th uh, thing to notice from this study is going back again to um, the patients exposed at younger age, is you can see that the younger patients, the, the, the patients that were exposed at the age of five years and younger, had more pronounced um, um, gene um, gene genomic alterations if you compare them to the patients that were exposed at an older age, showing the importance of having an exposure at a younger, more vulnerable age, which is an, an important uh, aspect when you look at, when you investigate whether certain exposures have an impact on a disease outcome. So I want to also talk about a little bit about uh, the potential impact of exposure to heavy metals. Heavy metals are known to accumulate in the thyroid gland, and some metals play a role in thyroid function. There are, as we know, as we call them, essential elements. However, there are some metal ions that are known endocrine disruptors, and I will talk a little bit more about endocrine disruptors later on. Uh, but um, but some just have the um, the characteristics of impacting the, the function, so like cadmium, lead, um, uh, mercury, and some have been classified as carcinogenic. And a lot of this research into heavy metals and thyroid cancer came following these epidemiological studies that found increased thyroid cancer rates in certain volcanic regions. So a well-studied region is the region around Mount Etna in Sicily, where they found higher concentrations of metals in soil, water, and, and vegetation around, around Mount Etna. And as you can see here on this, um, on this map of Sicily, is that, that they, there are higher rates of thyroid cancer in both females and males, just in the area around Mount Etna. And, and in, in comparison with these regions that are a little further away, and it's even in, in, in more important in, in a difference with regions that are on mainland Italy. So this is not the only uh, region where that happened. There are multiple regions around the world where there are volcanic areas or and, and, and around and ex populations around that show higher thyroid cancer. So is this potentially associated with the exposure to heavy metals? So what we did is we did a study on uranium exposure. Um, uranium is a heavy metal. It's naturally occurring, and it's um, a, a naturally occurring radioactive element, and it has a wide distribution in the soil and higher concentrations in certain rock formation, formations. So not only around these volcanic, um, in these volcanic regions, but also in the Rocky Mountains, for instance. In the U.S., you have higher concentrations of uranium, and the effect that these, this uranium has um, some chemical 
toxicity makes the EPA, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S., in, um, in pla put in place a maximum allowed contaminant level of 30 micrograms per liter for drinking water, just to show um, that that you should not be exposed to high levels. So we did a study using the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, which is a population-based uh, survey in the U.S., which is done in a two-year cycle, where they invite a uh, rep representative um, sample of the general population to partake in this survey. It consists of a questionnaire, it also consists of a medical examination and lab uh, where um, an array of exposures and, um, and specific markers are tested. So this gives us the opportunity to look at certain exposures, including uranium and thyroid health. So thyroid function was uh, examined in three cycles, and we were, for this study, able to use two cycles, the cycle 2007-2008 and 2009-2010, uh, which overlapped also with uranium exposure, which was measured in urine. So we included those, th those um, two years and the subsamples having both uranium and thyroid, and excluded, excluded participants that had either condition or use medication affecting thyroid function, so thyroid medication, thyroid disease, or pregnancy, leaving a, a final sample size of a little over 3,000 uh, patients. And we were mainly interested in thyroid-related antibodies, so uh, anti-TPO and thyroglobin antibodies. And this was because from the literature we knew that positive thyroglobin antibodies may be a predictor for thyroid cancer in patients with thyroid nodules. And these positive thyroid global antibodies were an independent, were found to be an independent risk factor for thyroid cancer. So we thought, okay, maybe we can use it as a proxy and see if there is an association between those antibodies and uranium measured in urine in these, uh, in these um, non-thyroid disease uh, participants. And what we found was that when we divided uranium exposure into quartiles, you can see here following the red arrow is that um, with increasing quartiles from one to three, the um, levels of thyroglobin antibodies increased and then more or less stabilized from quartile uh, three to four. And then when we look at the association between um, those antibodies and um, uranium exposure in urine, uh, you can see that if we look at thyroglobin antibodies, although it did not reach significance when we used uranium continuously, there was a tendency towards a positive association. However, when we did this while uranium was divided into quartiles, you can see that there is a positive association, a significant positive association with thyroglobin antibodies. Um, and we did not find any association with uranium and anti-TPO, as you can see here on the right. So this study um, gave us a, a sort of an, an interesting insight into hmm, maybe there may be something there. Maybe uranium is associated with issues of, of, of thyroid gland, potentially thyroid cancer, but that we could not. From, because we were not unable to um, conclude from this study for multiple reasons, as well as that this is a cross-sectional database, so we both the exposure and um, these thyroid global antibodies are measured at the same time, so making it impossible to say that there's a causal association, but there are some indications that there may be something there. So we went a little further and looked at, and, and, and did a meta-analysis looking at an array of heavy metals and, and their association with thyroid cancer going over the literature. So we did an extensive systematic review of the literature um, and after exclusion of um, ineligible papers, we were able to include 19 studies 
that looked at this particular association. And I just want to show you this graph. I know it's a little bit of a full table, but I want to just highlight a couple of things. So although we found those 19 studies looking at heavy metals and thyroid cancer, and we did find one significant association for manganese, you can see here that um, if we divide it by metals, there are a lot of metals with a very limited number of studies looking at this particular association. So we divided up and compared thyroid cancer versus benign um, thyroid uh, um, diseases and thyroid cancer versus healthy controls, which was even, even less. There are only a handful of studies looking at this association. So that made it already, it makes it really difficult to uh, draw conclusions. And on the other hand, as you can see here, where we looked at the heterogeneity between all these studies, this, these studies are very heterogeneous, meaning that it becomes really difficult to put them together in a um, summary statistic and draw generalized conclusions from it. So as you can see, there's still a lot of work to do in investigating heavy metals in, and their association with thyroid cancer. So I want to shift gears a little and talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals for the rest of my presentation, as this is a hot topic and we hear a lot about it also in the news. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are defined as ex exogenous substances or mixtures that alter function of the endocrine system and subsequently cause adverse health effects. And this is a definition by the World um, Health Organization. So the potential of chemicals to impact endocrine systems, so not only the thyroid, but I'll be focusing on the thyroid, but it's, 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 it's endocrine system across the board, was first described in 1962 when investigators found that there was an, an effect of DDT exposure on wildlife. So following this first discovery, the first group of endocrine disruptant chemicals was identified in the environment and were named POPs, or Persistent Organic Pollutants. And as you can hear in this name, um, these are persistent chemicals. These are chemicals that degrade very slowly over time. So thus exposing us over a very long period of time and having potentially having an enormous impact on not only wildlife, but, um, but the general population as well. And in 1971, um, another important uh, study came out, which was the first study to publish an association between the exposure to an endocrine disrupting chemical and cancer. And this was when vaginal, an increased risk of vaginal cancers was found in girls born to um, DES or death using mothers. So, um, so this was the first indication that pot potential exposures to these chemicals, to these EDCs, may have severe health consequences. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are all around. Um, and we are exposed to them on a daily basis. So here are just to name a few and, and give you a, a couple of examples of products um, that you are potentially exposed to on a daily basis. So um, PFAS chemicals, I will go into detail a little bit more on that later. Um, you hear a lot about that in the news uh, these, these last years, these are, uh, highly used chemicals, uh, also called forever chemicals, and we're exposed to them through a variety of products. Uh, PCBs um, are endocrine disruptors. Uh, an array of pesticides are endocrine disruptors. Flame retardants that are used um, throughout a lot of different products. BPA, uh, there have been a while ago a lot of studies on BPA in Bottles for babies, that is now uh, not allowed anymore up to year three. They're banned from using them in uh, plastic uh, bottles. Um, phthalates, air pollution uh, consists uh, 
of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, also endocrine disruptors. So all these pollutants have an effect on thyroid function. However, some of these have um, also some car carcinogenic effect. Um, there's still a lot of work to do to look at what their potential association is with thyroid cancer. We published in a, a really broad overview in 2021 of these endocrine disrupting chemicals and thyroid cancer. And um, you can look up the paper, but there's, there's, there, there are studies out there, but overall, um, the studies have some conflicting results, and there's there's still a lot of, of work to do to to see if these um, these these chemicals are carcinogenic for the thyroid. They have a most of them have a long environmental health half life, as I, as I already mentioned. So there are a lot of these chemicals once in the environment, they'll stay there for a very long time, years up to decades. Some have been associated with thyroid cancer, and some have been banned from manufacturing or have been phased out by companies themselves due to these potential health effects. And I just want to give you um, a little bit of an insight on how these chemicals and the production of these chemicals has increased over time. So this was a study done on diabetes on the left, where you can see where they nicely overlaid the prevalence of diabetes with these chemical productions, and you can see that the, the blue line is the, um, the chemical, the production of these chemicals over time, and you see an exponential increase, uh, as well as the exponential increase of diabetes, and you see, as we all know, this exponential increase in thyroid cancer, and, and the question is, is this just by coincidence, or is there a potential associ association between this? So a lot of the work that I do is uh, on the World Trade Center, uh, the, the, the population exposed to the World Trade Center disaster. And I'll explain the link between the previous slide and, and, and this population uh, on this slide. So as we know, um, the lower side of Manhattan was exposed to an enormous dust cloud and debris exposition um, just following the World Trade Center disaster in 2001. So researchers went out and collected this dust to see what kind of pollutants and chemicals were actually in this dust um, that was found, but it was layers thick um, on, on this, in this wide area of downtown Manhattan. And besides finding carcinogens, not necessarily carcinogens associated with thyroid cancer, but carcinogens, construction materials, asbestos, they also found endocrine disrupting chemicals in there. Flame retardants, as you can imagine, uh, dioxins, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, phthalates, or as, as a whole array of endocrine disrupting chemicals that was found in this dust. And there were also metals found, just as a side note. So metals is a little bit interesting. They are sometimes classified as, as um, endocrine disruptive, but sometimes not. So that's why I put them in here because they do affect thyroid function as, I, as we discussed previously. So epidemiological research following the World Trade Center disaster showed that uh, multiple populations exposed to this dust shown an increased risk of thyroid cancer. Um, so here I, I just named three different populations. We have the World Trade Center Health Program, which is a, a program consisting of rescue and recovery workers that are followed here at Mount Sinai Hospital. And we found that these, this population has a twofold increase risk of thyroid cancer. Um, and this was replicated in two other cohorts. The second one is the health registry cohort. It's also um, results of rescue and recovery workers. And the last one are the firefighters of New York. Um, and also we found the same thing we found to about twofold increase of uh, excess risk of thyroid cancer. So the question came up, is this because we see these patients on a regular basis? So just to take a step back, as following the World Trade Center disaster, uh, rescue and recover workers, but also survivors that were exposed to the uh, disaster and to the dust, have the right to annual health screenings. 
And um, although, again, this health screening does not contain a TSH um, um, laboratory test, um, they do come in. And you can imagine that um, if they mention something, it's easily added to, um, to this screening visit. And some also undergo lung cancer uh, screening, uh, so CT scans, uh, where you can also find uh, thyroid nodules potentially. So there is an increased surveillance of this population. So people started asking the questions, well, maybe it's because we just see more of, of these patients and we therefore find more of these tumors, or is it because of this exposure? Right. So the first study that we did was um, just a descriptive epidemiological assessment of this population and comparing these exposed populations with the Mount Sinai Cancer Registry data to see if we, under the hypothesis of surveillance, would find them at a lower tumor size and at an earlier age. And we did not find a significant difference with the uh, Mount Sinai non-exposed um, thyroid cancer cases, which contradicts a little bit that it's only because of surveillance, right? We, we, we couldn't, from this data, say, okay, well, this has to do with, with surveillance, that is it. So we thought, okay, let's dig a little deeper and look at maybe there is some physician bias there. Maybe if patients come in and tell their physician, well, I was there on the site or um, closely after, um, that physician are more inclined to say, okay, this is potentially a tumor because they, of course, do not want to risk missing a cancer. So maybe they, there are some false positive diagnosis in there. So we did a case control study using a, a panel of molecular markers, which is highly sensitive and specific to discriminate benign from malignant nodules. Um, and, and the panel works as follows. So if three of the four markers are colored positive and one remains negative, the slide was, uh, the, the nodule was uh, defined as positive. If all the markers are positive, it's possibly a hurdle cell adenoma. And if they all remain negative, it was a benign nodule. And we did this, we compared 30 cases to 30 controls, matched controls on age, um, histology and sex. And this is what it looks like. Um, and we did this in collaboration with our with our team in Brazil, um, led by Dr. Sarudi, um, who developed this technique. Um, so this is an example of what ma a malignant nodule looks like, right? So three are colored positive and one remains negative. So this case and this control are both thyroid cancer. And we used it to see, are there any false positive diagnosis amongst the World Trade Center potentially associated with each cancer. And what we found was that there were no false positive diagnosis. And the only reason why we did not reach 100% a malignancy is that for three patients, there was not enough uh, tumor tissue in the slides to do the molecular testing, uh, but we didn't find any difference between those two groups. So, concluded after these two first studies that overdiagnosis associated with either physician or surveillance bias does not adequately explain this excess risk. So there may be something else in play here as well. So the next study that we did, we are still using the same case control study. Uh, for this study, we had 20 World Trade Center World Trade Center thyroid cancers and 23 matched controls. We started with the 3030, but there was not enough DNA to complete the mutational analysis, unfortunately, for uh, a couple of the patients. What we did find was that there was a higher frequency of third promoter mutations in the World Trade Center thyroid cancers compared to the non exposed, non World Trade Center. Uh, exposed thyroid cancers. While BRAF, there was no difference in BRAF uh, these are kind of e, uh, mutation. In the unadjusted analysis, you can see an increased odds for the third promoter mutation um, in the exposed versus the non-exposed group. While this was not, uh, although we 
tended towards significance in the adjusted analysis. We did not reach significance, but we have, uh, unfortunately, a low sample size. Um, so this indicates that there may be something there. Maybe these exposures, this array of pollutants that these, these patients were exposed to has a potential impact on, on certain mutations in, in, in the thyroid. Um, and we're currently working on, as, as there are these indications, what could be the mechanistic, mechanistic, uh, mechanistic uh, route between these exposures and, and, and these cancers. So I'm working with a team of researchers here at Mount Sinai in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health to disentangle this even further, again, using this matched case control study design and the samples that were, um, were collected from these patients to see whether some of these World Trade Center related pollutants are potentially found in the tissue of these patients. So um, we're doing an untargeted metabolomic study on these um, paraffin fixed pathology samples in collaboration with Lauren Patrick. And we do a small pilot study on metals uh, using a, a spatial analysis. So we, we, we use the same slides uh, of these uh, cases and the control cases to see the, the metals in the tissue and the potential spatial association with local markers of inflammation as potential pathway to uh, thyroid carcinogenesis. Um, so we're still working on, on this. So hopefully um, been, we'll be able to present some of these um, results. So I want to briefly also talk about another study um, that we recently um, finished uh, using the Biome Biobank program, which is a population-based biobank program at the Aachen School of Medicine here. Um, so what this biobank has and collects is, um, so anybody can enroll. It's not a patient um, population. It's a, it's a population-based uh, registry. Uh, it enrolls patients, it asks, asks them a bunch of questions, uh, they fill out a questionnaire, plasma samples are collected, and if the patients are Sinai patients, they are followed up through their medical records over time following their enrollment to see if they develop any disease and also um, thus thyroid cancer. And it's a diverse population because it, it's from the various New York City boroughs and the larger New York State area. So we were able, using this, this program, to identify 88 thyroid cancer cases that were enrolled in this Biome program and have had their plasma sample taken before they were diagnosed with thyroid cancer um, as, a, um, as, a, as our case group. And we matched these cases with non-cancer controls. So these, this, the control group didn't have thyroid cancer, but also no other cancer. And we used their plasma samples to do untargeted metabolomics uh, on endocrine disrupting chemicals to see if there is a potential pathway between these endo endocrine disrupting chemicals and thyroid cancer. And the first analysis uh, and results that we have available are on PFAS. So just to reiterate, um, PFAS chemicals are widespread and cause a global contamination. They are very resistant to degradation, so they remain in the, in the environment for, for decades. Studies done, including using the NHANES uh, um, population of, um, of the, um, the American population, found that over 99% of the population has PFAS chemicals in their blood. So you can see the impact of this exposure. Um, we're exposed through multiple consumer product, product, products since the 1950s when it started to become of use in a variety of product, products. Non-stick frying pans, fast food wrappers, cosmetics, uh, water-resistant clothing, firefighting foam. There's, there, it's, 
in a lot of things that we're exposed on a daily basis. So the two most frequently used, at least in the past, uh, and well-known are PFOA and PFOS. And they are currently no longer manufactured in the U.S. because the companies uh, decided themselves to phase out um, the production of these two. However, they've been replaced with multiple new PFAS systems, including Gen X. I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but there, there are a lot of different PFAS chemicals uh, at the moment that were, they're still used and manufactured and that works. Even after um, having PFAS absorbed in, in your body, in your bloodstream, um, they have a long elimination half-life. Uh, depends a little bit on the chemical, but it takes years um, to um, have their um, concentration cut in half. Some have been, uh, so they have been linked to thyroid hormone disruption. So that's, that's one of the definitions. And um, PFOA is possibly carcinogenic, so good to be as um, defined by the Inter International Agency for Cancer, for Research on Cancer, IARC. And uh, not that long ago, in November last year, the American Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, has published a PFAS strategic roadmap to really start to better know the impact of PFAS and make sure that we are exposed to that. And also important to note is that the factory 3M, a uh, big producer of these chemicals, uh, recently um, published in, in also last year, November last year, that they will phase out and completely stop the production of all PFAS chemicals by 2025. So you can see the potential impact and, and worry about these chemicals. So we, using our Biome data, looked at the association of an array of PFAS chemicals and thyroid cancer in our, in our case control study and found that one of those chemicals, the linear PFOS chemical, PFOS, as you can see here, was significantly positively associated with, a, with, with thyroid cancer compared to our healthy controls, which is, of course, of in very important, uh, a very important result as it's very difficult to find these associations between exposures and cancer over time. So this is the first prospective study to find this association. This, we're currently working on finalizing the results and will be submitted for publication soon. Another thing that we did using this data is we, we divided our groups into um, a high PFAS exposure and a low PFAS exposure. The, 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 the PFAS that we found that was significantly associated and, uh, and compared that to the risk of th developing thyroid cancer over time. And you can see that there is an increased risk of developing thyroid cancer in the high PFOS exposure group compared to the low PFOS exposure group. So um, we're really excited to share this important data with um, the scientific community and hopefully help in, well, getting um, more um, policies in place to make sure that we are over time less and less exposed to these kinds of chemicals. So what are our future steps of research? Uh, so as I showed you in this presentation, we're really combining basic science research, clinical and epidemiological research to find the answer on whether environmental exposures are associated with thyroid cancer, thyroid disease, and thyroid cancer aggressiveness. These are highly collaborative efforts um, and are not only um, collaborations within our institutions, these are national and international collaborations that look at this. We investigate certain populations at risk. So the World Trade Center is a very important population at risk for us to study that have had high exposure and potentially a higher incidence of disease so that we uh, can look and disentangle the role of these exposures um, in, in, in developing these diseases. We focus on pollutants that are known to be associated with the thyroid. Um, so that's why we're highly interested in these endocrine disrupting chemicals as they are already associated with the thyroid 
um, function uh, with the changes in thyroid function. And not only do we look at the um, thyroid to getting thyroid cancer, I think it's it's uh, a large part of our studies also looking at well what what falls after a patient has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Is there a difference between disease prog progression, prognosis, and survival in patients that were more heavily exposed compared to patients that were not as heavily exposed? Are patients that are heavily exposed developing more aggressive cancers? Do they have more disease recurrence? And maybe in the end, is their survival affected um, um, negatively associated with these exposures? So we started um, a study here in our uh, department where we enroll patients, thyroid patients that are um, diagnosed with thyroid cancer upon their diagnosis before they undergo surgery and can send them to be part of our direct P study. So we collect information uh, on their exposures. So we have them fill out an exposure questionnaire. We collect their blood samples using this uh, Dried blood spot collection kit, which is an, um, a kit that a patient can use themselves. Um, we do it in clinic when they're here, but we can also mail them the kit for their follow up so they don't have to come back to, to, commit, uh, to remain part of the study. They don't have to come back in to do the blood draw. They can do that at home and mail it back to us. And we store these, uh, these kits in our minus 80 uh, freezer so that we can do research on them over time. And so we follow them up for four years to see, okay, what are their, what are their exposures look like over time? And what does their thyroid cancer do? Do they, do they develop a recurrence? Um, um, what is their potential impact of certain exposures on their thyroid cancer over time following exposure? And we follow that up also using our electronic medical um, and it, this is really set up to help us answer certain research questions that we have um, in the potential role of the environment in, in, uh, in thyroid cancer. And as I mentioned, um, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators. Um, this is not a single person effort. We have a large team here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai that are uh, on all these projects. And we have a collaborating uh, collaboration with the James St. Peter's VA Medical Center as well, uh, looking at the same questions. And we um, have some funding, so I want to acknowledge my funders um, for the work that we do. Um, I want to again thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Dr. Van Gerwen, uh, thank you so much. I think I speak for everyone in the audience and the entire Tyro family in um, thanking you for this very insightful uh, lecture and congratulating you on your incredible work. I think th this, your work li leaves um, many of us with more questions than answers and, and it, it's a, an eye-opening situation here. Um, I have a couple of questions of my own. If the if the rest of the audience has any questions, I do encourage them to send them through the Q&A function so we can get to them quickly. I'm going to try the, to uh, choose the, the ones that I, I found more appealing. You, at the beginning of your lecture, you were speaking about the stabilizing effect in some countries that is seen. So the, there is apparently not a, a steady rise in the, in the incidence of thyroid cancer worldwide. Is there any, in your knowledge, is there any um, intervention that has been identified that has lowered the, the growth of this incidence, or is it us just being more conscious and screening less? If we could say that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, I think um, I think that it has a large large part to do with us being more conscious about the potential impact if we screen. So, as as you are aware, if we look at aut uh, autopsy studies a large part of the population um, dies with thyroid nodules and potentially cancers in their thyroid. So there is a um, whole reservoir of patients that if we would start screening everyone, as we, as we saw in South Korea, we find a lot of cancer. So I think uh, following 
a lot of the literature and of course these discussions that that people in the field have on on how how to to go about screening for thyroid cancer we we all became more aware of hmm, maybe we shouldn't screen as much maybe we shouldn't look for them if they don't have symptoms and open up this reservoir of patients that may never develop disease uh, that leads to either symptoms or or affect their survival. So I think that has a large part to do with it. But as I mentioned, right, if you look at, at the tumor sizes then, it's mainly the, the smaller ones that we don't find anymore. That one is stabilizing. The, the larger tumors were still going up in that recent publication. So that also shows that impact of hmm, maybe we're just not looking for those anymore, and um, and we're we're just more cautious with uh, screening, preventing this overdiagnosis. Correct. Did did you find any geographical association in like or trends that you 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 would say in this part of the world or and not this part of the world that the the incidence is not growing do you find any any um correlation with or, or correlation with with uh where it's growing where it's not and the trends of how they screen thyroid cancer yeah yeah that's a that's a great question actually so i'm from um i worked as a physician in um the netherlands for a long time and in france where there's a different health system and so i was it was for me very interesting to see so the Netherlands has a very strict health system where patients cannot go and see a specialist right away. It always goes through the general practitioner. That's the first stop there. If the if, and 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 if they don't feel that it needs to go on, um, there's no there's no screening done, no um, ultrasound. So it's not a very much screened population, in my opinion, as I compare it to the health system here, right? Um, and even there, you see an uptick in thyroid cancer, maybe not as high, but it goes up in time. So I think even in, in other health systems where screening may potentially not be as much of a factor as it is in others, we do see this increase. So, yeah. Mm, very interesting. We have one question from Dr. Mike Villa in, in the audience. Hi, Dr. Villa. Um, He's asking, due to the association of thyroid cancer with obesity that you mentioned, should a patient's body mass index be added to the decision-making process for FNA biopsy when about evaluating a patient with a thyroid nodule? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, so I think the obesity really shows the complexity of this whole um well, this whole body of research that is ongoing, right? Because obesity in itself is on the rise, as we all know. Um, diabetes is on the rise. Um, these, these, these endocrine disruptors are on the rise. Is that all part of the same problem? Is it all something that is going on in our diet that, 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 that makes us go up? Um, and have more diabetes, more obesity, more thyroid cancer, more exposure. So I think that in that sense, in my research, I think it's an, it's an important part and it's definitely something that we always adjust for because it's a known risk factor. Uh, so we adjust for obesity in when we look at certain exposures. Should we, so I'm not a practicing clinician, so for me to answer the question, should we add that to a risk factor when we do FNAs? Um, it's a great question, actually. Uh, but there is definitely, there's definitely uh, a lot of research out there that shows that obesity is a risk factor for thyroid cancer. I am just wondering, is it just the obesity in itself, or are there other things that are potentially associated with this? that are the, the uh, underlying or mixed risk factor in this, in this link. Well, very interesting. Well, we're on the obesity um, subject. Um, I have a couple of questions. Is there any 
BMI category that is more prone to have thyroid cancer? That's my first question. And the second question would be, in your knowledge, is there any, I mean, the intervention intervention of weight loss, have you seen that to predict or, or prevent the appearance of a thyroid cancer or thyroid nodules? Yeah, so I'm not a necessarily an expert on obesity. And I think given all these questions, um, I'll do a deeper dive in the literature to see if this, especially this last question, if there is a decrease in risk if people start losing weight, it goes, it goes, is your risk going down? I think it's a hard question to answer actually, but we can definitely look into it and see what is, what's been done on that. So I don't have a, an exact answer for that one. Um, I think with increasing weight, your risk goes up. That is definitely shown. Awesome. I, I wanted to, I have another really interesting question, but I want to acknowledge the, the amazing work that you did with the World, uh, with the World Trade Center uh, series of studies that you've done. Um, I have a question. Do you, do you, did you find any differences in the patient, in the population characteristics against what is commonly um, reported in the, in the literature? I mean, you spoke about age and tumor size, but what about gender? I, 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 if I don't recall incorrectly, um, Dr. Louise Davies was telling us that there isn't that big of a gap in, in gender between male and female thyroid cancer incidence and prevalence. Uh, it is maybe so, and she, she hypothesized that it's that women get uh, often more surveillance or they go to see a doctor more often than men. So did you see any other uh, patient or population characteristics that were different from what is commonly reported in age or any other um, factor, variable? Yeah, well, thank you. So the World Trade Center um, exposed population, especially the re rescue and recovery workers, that's what we did most of our work on, is a very interesting population because it, it's mainly men. Uh, because these are often firefighters and people that went in, policemen, uh, other people that helped with the cleanup effort. So it's 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 a it's a, a population consists of mere, more males than females. Uh, another very interesting thing of this population is that they are on the on the across the board a healthy population. Well, a they're already a worker population. So people that are working, it's the healthy worker effect, are compared to the general population, more healthy. And these were all fit, healthy rescue and recovery workers. So they were, um, the level of obesity was lower, for instance, and they were also, uh, most of them were non-smokers. So it was a very interesting, healthy male population with an increased risk of thyroid cancer, which is interesting to compare that to the literature, where we find that more in females um, um, than males. So um, it, it definitely poses a lot of questions why that is. Why is it, is it then only because we look or are we just having them, having them being exposed to a lot of, of these, these pollutants? And, um, we are working with the uh, people at um, NYU, the New York University, to see at the survivor population, because that's a little bit of a different population that was exposed to 9-11. These are the people that lived in the area and went to school there at the time. So we're exposed through that route, and it's a different population. It's a younger population. That we also have younger people exposed. And it's just a mix of male, female, so really a more population base. And I'm really curious to see if there's a difference between those rescue and recovery workers. Wow, that's really interesting. We're almost again the nine o'clock hour, but before we go, I would I don't wanna I don't wanna lose the opportunity to ask you. Uh, you probably don't have enough data to answer this one, but uh, have have you looked into the pandemic effect on thyroid cancer incidence? I mean, COVID nineteen turned the world around us. And then um, we started wearing masks. We, we had less exposure to chemicals, I'm guessing. Uh, you could probably speak more to this. Uh, we used um, 
uh, you know, hand washing gel and all that jazz, different exposures. Do you feel, do you ponder that there's a different incidence during those COVID weird years that we had? Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of research ongoing at the moment and in an in 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 international effort to look at diagnosis of cancers across the board and if that changed during that period of time when people didn't go to a doctor as much. I don't have results yet. It's still ongoing. So unfortunately, I hope that that will come out in the near future, but it's definitely, would definitely be interested to look at in light of, is it all because of surveillance in this period when we, when we didn't do that as much? And did that affect thyroid cancer? So um, even, even the SEER database, it, I think it's coming out now. Um, so it, it has a lag of two years, but would be very interesting to see if there's an effect of COVID, of, of this COVID period on, on, on the incidence of thyroid cancer. Well, that, that's really interesting. Um, please keep us posted. <laughs> um, so we're against the nine o'clock hour here. I want to thank you so much on behalf of the Thank Foundation, the Tyro team, and all of our listeners. And uh, I want to invite everyone to be here with us next week um, on our next Tyro by MD's webinar session. And uh, to everyone, please keep safe. And we do encourage you to look out for the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer that's coming up this um, this summer in London. So. To all, be safe. Have a great weekend.